we have with two of our guests. To my immediate left is Jim Connaughton with Constellation Energy. He was uh, a decision maker in the Bush administration regarding environmental and energy policy. Further left, Dan Weiss with the Center for American Progress, a veteran of policy pushes in all sorts of campaigns and drives. Gentlemen, thanks again for being with us. And I want to start with you, Jim. You are... Do we need a microphone? Yes. 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 And uh, we should get uh, Jim and Dan hooked up as well while we're talking about If you're testifying before the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, they're now discussing how to devise a clean energy standard. What do you say? What compromises clean energy? What forms should qualify? Uh, so the issue of clean, there's two components traditionally in America. Clean in terms of cutting conventional air pollution that directly impacts the environment and public health. And then clean is more intangibly described as contributing to reduction of greenhouse gases. Today in America, we actually enjoy all energy sources either already fitting the first definition of clean or well on the way to completely fulfilling it from coal all the way to, all the way to traditional renewables. So the, the debate of clean, if it includes CO2 as, quote, clean, obviously we've got a long way to go. So, so that's important. Now, I, I just want to observe this has absolutely nothing to do with the, with the motion that was in front of us, which was, will it drive economic recovery? And the fact of the matter is, it is close to impossible unless something magical happened tomorrow, because it's not clean energy that's going to drive economic recovery. It's much cheaper energy that would drive economic recovery, whether it fits your definition of clean. And right now, there's no energy source on the horizon that looks like overnight you know, i.e. the next two years, is going to dramatically cut our energy costs. And I just want to make one other observation. In addition to being cheap, um, you know, it's cheaper energy, not cleaner energy, that goes to the motion. The other thing I just want to emphasize is I'm a huge fan of really clean energy. Uh, but the issue there is transition to clean, you know, from dirtier sources to cleaner sources. It, it really is not, again, unless it's a lot cheaper, it's not going to affect economic recovery, and here's why. Uh, the, the, uh, we have a $13 trillion economy. The energy spend is 9% of that, so you know about $1.1 trillion. Um, the capital spend annually is $80 billion. So we'll be spending about $80 billion a year to upgrade the system uh, over the next 10 years. So that's $800 billion. Um, so you're talking about a, a six one thousandths of, the percent of, a, of, of GDP. And even if you doubled with mandates or incentives, doubled the uh, requirements for clean energy, from 80 billion to 160 billion, let's say, annually, which is something like Waxman Markey would do, it still is an infinitesimal net contribution to GDP. So, so clean energy doesn't advance GDP, it supplies it. It's, um, it's the other way around. Strong economic growth is what will drive cleaner energy because there'll be more money sloshing through the system that allows us to transition the system faster. So I think the question should have been turned completely around. Mm. Will strong economic growth drive clean energy? Dan, semantics and definitions aside of what is clean energy, is it more about cost and expense and the economics more so than the generation source? Well, the, very, the most important thing to remember, in, in my view, that was not talked about at all in the debate, is that the reason why some fuels are so cheap is that A, they've been subsidized for 100 years like coal, or uh, 90 years like oil, or 60 years like nuclear, and B, these, some of these fuels do not internalize the cost that is borne by society for using them. For example, last year, the National Academy of Sciences came out with a report that said the combustion of uh, oil and coal adds a cost to our society $120 billion annually due primarily to premature deaths, uh, health uh, expenditures, lost productivity, and the like. Is that cost reflected in the cost of coal-generated electricity? No, it is not. So the reality is, is that, uh, of course, coal is going to be cheaper than sources that don't, that don't add the you know, pollution to the air, because that cost is borne by all of us. And so I think that's a very important part that was left out of this debate. I agree with Jim that the way that the uh, question was posed was, um, 
a little bit too specific to be useful because, in fact, it's hard to see how any individual sector of the economy is going to drive the recovery. In fact, uh, there's a whole bunch of things will drive it. I think the question is really, is there a clean energy path that will help lead to long-term economic growth? And I would agree with that statement that yes, it would. And that's the agenda that the President has, has laid out during his State of the Union and during his budget. It's a long-term uh, pathway forward that is based on innovation, competitiveness, job creation, and economic growth in the next big sector. I was struck by Robert Bryce's opening remarks that if he were around in 1985, he'd say, why bother with this internet thing? It's so much easier to just to mail a letter. Um, and you know, of course, when technologies are in their infancy or their adolescence, they're less reliable and more expensive than what they're replacing. But with government investment and smart government policy, that focuses on market creation, finance of research, uh, development and deployment, and infrastructure, then those three things, as Governor Ritter was saying, can help lead to long-term growth, uh, economic growth, and uh, competitiveness. Dan, you touch on jobs, job creation, long-term job creation. That seems to be a valid element, if not the definition, of driving the economy or economic growth. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, and if you look, uh, California is a great example. Uh, it's a state that is, uh, with their state policies, have tried to do all three things. Create markets for these new technologies so that there's a reason for investors to invest in them. They've helped with finance to get these technologies uh, R, D, and D and get them off the ground. And then they're now investing in infrastructure. And California, the clean tech sector, has actually seen some growth during the Great Recession compared to all the other sectors of the California economy. I don't know, maybe James Cameron blockbusters might be the exception. But otherwise, the clean tech sector has been one of the few bright spots in the California economy, which has been one of the hardest hit by the Great Recession. So I think that's evidence that with those three kinds of policies for markets, finance, and infrastructure, we can have uh, growth driving uh, investments in clean tech. But, Jim, you can create as many jobs as you'd like as an administration or as a Congress if you can get the federal funding to subsidize the sector, right, to pay for these jobs in a sense. Yeah, well, we heard the debate, and I, you know, just pick whatever number you want. The subsidies can add up to the equivalent of, let's say, $250,000 a job. Well, if you just directly threw that out into the economy, you could get, you'd do a lot of $40,000 a year jobs, right? Um, and so there'd be many more jobs if you just kept the money in the economy to find um, the more cost-effective ways to create jobs. So, so where Dan and I are in violent agreement, it is worth it and it's cost-effective and over time probably affordable to transition to a system that is very, very clean. All right, so, so there's no disagreement there. I, I would disagree that with the current cost structure of the different sources, I would disagree that there'd be a net increase in jobs. The math just doesn't work that way. Uh, and just, you just have to look, if, if you have to layer on um, you know, under any of the pros, if you have to layer on something that adds 10% to the cost of electricity, mm -hmm. right, that's that much more money you're spending for the same amount of energy that would otherwise be invested more profitably elsewhere in the economy. So I can certainly add up the green jobs, but I can just as easily go find the ones that were lost then. But California, Jim, California, remember California, remember California can enjoy net jobs right. in the green sector, but you can also hear the huge sucking, job, uh, sucking sound of the non-green energy related jobs to Texas and other states. So, um, and California's suffering under terrible unemployment right now, it's getting worse. Uh, and so you can, you can count yourself lucky for green jobs, but you know, the government's not very good about orienting those investments. It's better to keep that money in the private sector. But again, I want to be clear, we can, with sensible policies that I think both Dan and I support, affordably get to a much cleaner system. So, mm -hmm. so don't mistake what I'm saying. I don't think it would be a net adder, unless right now natural gas has simply displaced coal as the cheaper fossil source. It hasn't really changed the overall cost of energy. It's that game changer like a flat panel TV where it's got more value and people pay three times more for what it replaced, and yet it uses less stuff, right? That's what we want in the energy system, that breakthrough technology that all of a sudden cuts the cost in half. Nobody's offered it yet, but I'm hoping for it. You know, one of the things you have to remember is the cost may go up 10%, but the cost to society may be a net benefit because it doesn't have the externalities that are now picked up by society at large. I have an idea. People who are against subsidies for clean energy technology, 
if the coal companies, the oil companies, and nuclear companies give back all the money they've received, starting back in, in the early uh, 1900s, then we can have wind and solar do the same thing. And then we've got a level playing field. But until that happens, we are now investing in growth. It's interesting, uh, the Environmental Law Institute just did a study of the last 10 years. And they found when it came to subsidies, and this includes ethanol, that for every $6 invested in fossil fuels, there was $1 invested in renewables, counting ethanol as a separate category. So we're already investing far more money in the, uh, I would say, conventional sector than we are in the new sector. Interestingly enough, our, one of our biggest economic competitors, China, is investing $12 billion a month in their clean tech sector. And if we want to remain economic, com economically competitive to be a, get a big slice of that $2 trillion a year clean tech market that's going to be existing by the end of this decade, we need to increase our investments so we can build markets, we can help finance our D&D, and we create the infrastructure to bring these products uh, to commercial scale. All right, Jeremy, let's bounce around a few more questions. And I want to turn to you in the audience right now. We have a few microphones floating around. So just raise your hands and just say who you are, whom you're from. We can uh, get an introduction briefly. And I want to start with someone whose mind was changed about that the That leaves debate. Dave out of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm even more against this. Dave Kreutzer, please. <laughs> Dave, go right oh, ahead. Uh, well, no, my mind was not changed. That's OK. okay. You can still start. Yeah. You're holding the um, microphone. I, I think the, the Introduction, briefly. Okay, Thank so you. I'm David Kreutzer. I'm an energy and climate economist at the Heritage Foundation. Um, I think the way the question is posed, it sounds like people that aren't in favor of more government mandates and uh, subsidies are against innovation. And nothing could be further from the truth. I think the question should have been, can markets more effectively lead to greater innovation to help drive the economy? And I would be pro that one. Um, and so I, I, I think you know, if we, we look around, we get tremendous innovation from private markets in energy and everywhere else. When we look at running this through the government process, we can have great theories about innovation, but we end up with Solyndra's and evergreen technology where it's just a, a suck, because a suck from the economy because they have the political power, all right? And we're working on political rates of return instead of economic rates of return. So. I don't want to monopolize this, and I'll be happy to answer some responses later if I have time. Well, well I think that's so what you're that's saying that the uh, general, hold industry on, just, Dan, just, just oh, one second. Sorry. I just want to uh, uh, segue. <laughs> sorry. Does the government that was too big of a target, Tyler. <laughs> Heritage and cap, I understand. <laughs> um, that brings up the point. We hear it time and time again on the Hill. That is, the government needs to be agnostic. DOE, EPA, everybody needs to be agnostic about technology. Is that the case? Well. No, it's not the case, and it doesn't have to be the case. But I, I want to begin with, I, I agree with the, the comment, that, that markets are the best driver. Again, flat panels appeared on the scene without a government regulator in sight, and it was as if the gremlins took away all those CRTs loaded with hazardous substances and big and clunky and energy consumers. You know, it magically occurred in five years. You can't find a CRT anymore. I don't even um, know what a CRT is. What that's is a, that? That's the big, you know, the old TV sets. Cathode the ray old tube. cathode ray tubes they just magically disappeared from the US economy without a regulator in sight. So if you can find that solution, we don't need anything else. So that's good. Um, but then secondly, there are externalities. Dan talked about them, and I believe that, that are benefit cost justified, um, uh, health effects of, of air pollution, uh, some of the natural resource effects uh, of pollutants that you can do a reasonable cost benefit test on. You can disagree about, sort of about what that is, but there's, there's still a lot of value in that. And that's not the market's not going to price that. Uh, but uh, it, it is my belief that if we had, which we don't have in the power sector today, a nationally competitive electricity system, we could actually consolidate up like telecom did, um, we'd all have big balance sheets and we'd be doing these clean investments three times as fast because we'd have more capital to deploy at lower cost and we'd be going after the most efficient of the cleaner sources. But because we have a very fractured, overly right. regulated electricity market, we actually have to depend, and I don't like it, we are a competitive supplier of electricity and gas. We have to depend on the government to give us performance standards. And I do think it's appropriate for the government to set a performance standard and at that point get the heck out. You know, so whether it's a subsidy, say I've got $10 billion and performance weighted. And let us compete. Let the person who can get the greatest reductions with the greatest efficiency to get the biggest amount of subsidy, that's the way we should be doing our subsidies. Or if you're going to do a mandatory program, it should be the simplest 
market-based design where the government's not touching any money, and you're just letting the private sector find the cheapest way to get there. These are time-tested policy measures. We just keep forgetting to performance weight them. And I think that's where we could probably agree to agree as well. Well, it, you're right that we have a 1930s designed electricity system that makes innovation harder. There's such a thing as market failure because a free market depends on complete information. It depends on rational actors, two things that are often in short supply in this country. Um, and so we're ne we don't have free markets. Look at all the investments that have been made in the conventional technologies that we use today. One of the roles that government can play is to help seed investment in high risk, high reward technologies, like the internet. A great example, we would not have the internet today without government investment under the DARPA program to get that off the ground. And uh, what's, what's disturbing is that the House Republican budget would actually drastically slash money for that sort of research and development to develop the next internet, high risk but high reward, clean energy technology. And I just, I can't resist commenting at the end that it, Dave is right. The solar industry has a lot of political clout in this country compared to oil companies. You are absolutely right, Dave. And in fact, the reality is that the reason why the Evergreen Company failed is because the price of solar energy is dropping too fast for what their business model was. So, that, so we should afford more money there or less money there? Uh, I think that we need to have a smarter money there and make sure that people have a reasonable plan. The other thing is the government needs to help create markets for new technologies in this area because we lack complete information and we lack rational actors. Yeah, but l let me quickly, just in briefly, if we had a performance weighted subsidy, and I don't care, pick your number, 10 billion, 100 billion, don't care what it is, and or a performance weighted uh, uh, regulatory program, but it's purely based on performance, you don't need any of, any of this, this government research program because what will happen is the private sector will see a clearly identifiable market signal at billions of dollars of scale and they'll be competing to be the one to deliver on that at the lowest cost. We saw that with the acid rain trading program. We saw it with the lead phase out. I mean, I could give you five or six other examples where performance oriented government policy drove much more innovation than government labs or others could have done. So especially in the, in the energy sector. Um, there may be other sectors you want to invent really new stuff that the market's not looking for. But this is big. We already, it's already mature. There's billions of dollars at stake. And so I would submit you could do a heck of a lot more at less cost to the taxpayer with some combination of those policies. And let me just throw in one quick thing. One of the reasons why we need government involvement is that there's a so-called tragedy of the commons. Nobody worries about something because they think somebody else will take care of it. I think a great example of this right now is our electricity infrastructure. The delivery of electrons, whether they're uh, from fossil or from nukes or from renewables, is reliant on our grid system, which is antiquated and doesn't go in the right places. But it's always somebody else's business Somebody else is worried to take care of that. That's why, you know, in the uh, Senate passed, Senate Energy Committee passed bill in 2009, they had a, a proposal in there that would help nationalize the idea of creating a workable uh, electricity grid. Just like in the 50s, we created an inter interstate highway system where people in Florida are helping to pay for uh, interstate highways in Idaho because we had a national interest which isn't accounted for in a free market. We had a national interest in having uh, ability to move goods and services and initially troops uh, across the country in, in a way that you never get any state to individually invest in an interstate highway system. Clean energy can drive the US economy. The motion passed in New York. It didn't pass here. Again, who changed their mind? Who was swayed by the debate or at least thought one side did a better job clearly than the other? I'm curious whose vote changed. Alex Flint with NEI, please, Alex. Tyler, I'll tell you that I changed my vote based not so much on changing my mind, but on the merits of the arguments made by the panelists. I, I thought the, those arguing against the motion did a very good job of focusing on near-term economic considerations of energy production. I think, on the other hand, they and the others ignored both the social benefits and the social costs associated with energy production. The whole reason that government gets involved in these sorts of issues and establishes policy which creates winners and losers. I think there was a much stronger case to be made that there is an appropriate role for government in that place 
and, and that governments around the world are going to be engaged in that. And as a result, there will be markets for green technologies. So I think it's inevitable that there are investment opportunities, that there are opportunities for people to, to make a lot of money in that marketplace. But I also recognize that it, it, for the most part, is because of government policies around the world, not because of the near-term economics of energy issues. Well, that brings up the issue of China, which was uh, touched on again and again. And that cited you did as well, Dan, right after this debate about the policy that is driving there. Isn't that just uh, a cover for regulation or uh, you know, a, a directive from the government pouring money into these sectors? Well, you know, I'm not, I would not want to switch my place with my counterpart if he's not in jail in China. Okay, let's make uh, that clear. As a foreign clear. journalist, I wouldn't trade either. Right, let's make that clear. But they have a, essentially a command and control economy. Now, my guess is even in China, it's sort of like here where the guy who drives the bulldozer is the one who makes environmental policy, ultimately. But they are able to direct investment in ways that our government doesn't do. Um, but let's be clear. Our government picks winners and losers all the time. We're spending $4 billion a year in tax subsidies to big oil companies that made a trillion dollars in profits in the last 10 years. One of the biggest is $1.7 billion a year for the domestic manufacturing tax credit that companies get, oil companies get, for drilling oil and gas that's either on, on U.S. land or in U.S. waters. It's not like they're going to pick the oil and gas up and move it to another country. You know, they can't do that. But the, at that tax credit designed to keep factories here gives a benefit of $1.7 billion there. That's a kind of economic inefficiency. My guess is they, they probably try and avoid in, in China. I just want to also agree with uh, Alex, one thing that Alex, at least I think, was implying, which is that the uh, opponents of clean energy have a very static view of the economy. That the economy today, energy or the rest of it, is going to look exactly like it does, 20 years from now, it's going to look exactly like it does today. And in fact, one of the reasons why we had the success that Jim talked about under the Clean Air Act of 1990 is that once you get the lobbyists and the CEOs out of the way, you give companies a goal and a timeline to make, to meet. You turn it over to the engineers and to the um, accountants. They will find a faster, better, cheaper way to do things. But you can't get that innovation, um, that you can't model that innovation which is why economic models over and over again almost always overstate costs of cleanup and understate, uh, I'm sorry, uh, understate benefits. Because there's innovation that's spurred once you know, engineers and other people like that are given real targets. And the Hayward-Bryce view is we've got a static economy. It's like this. It's going to stay like this. And any innovation will develop uh, by itself um, like with spontaneous uh, conception. Well, but the history of America is most inventiveness and innovation has occurred without the, without the hand of the government, by far. If you look Not at our, in the energy if, sector. Uh, especially in the energy sector. Uh, without the, government assistance, we would have nuclear power plants today? Give me a break, please, Jim. Uh, well, actually, that's an entirely different equation, which goes to the heart of what I mentioned, because we do not have a nationally competitive system. We do not have the consolidation of the capital formation that that allows. Therefore, we are dramatically constrained in our, in our ability to bring new capital to zero emission sources like nuclear, but also to sources like wind and solar. But that said, we are in the competitive markets, and within the last five years, we have made major investments in efficiency, we've made major investments in gas, we've made major investments in solar and in wind, uh, and we've dramatically cleaned up our coal-fired power plants. So if under the definition of President Obama's clean in the State of the Union, our fleet today because in the competitive markets where, where we operate with competitive forces, our fleet today either already meets the standard or is well on its way to meeting the standard. That's why I think the transition is entirely feasible because we're doing it in the competitive markets. It is the old monopolistic regulatory overlay that's the biggest impediment to innovation. So if there's one thing the government could do to open up innovation in the electricity sector is to get rid of the monopolies and let us compete with each other for the most efficient, cleanest supply. We're not being allowed to do that. And I don't, then I don't need the DOE labs. I don't need federal policy on, on these other infrastructure issues. We're going to make it happen because we're competing the heck out of each other. And it's great for consumers, too. But right now, if we had competition in the electricity sector 20 years ago, smart grid would have happened by now, just like all our cell phones are in our pockets right now. We would have had the same technologies in the homes because we'd be competing to put them there. But we have to wait two, three, four, five years for regulatory approvals to put 
a device in someone's home, you know, but, but the regulators are afraid of taking that risk that the private sector would take. And so you know, I, I think we should be thinking much bigger about what gets us to clean rather than sort of picking along the edges of this, which typically happens in this community. Well, you know, I, I, one of the, the silliest statements I thought I heard from Hayward and Bryce, I forgot who said it, is that President Obama's goal of 80% clean energy by 2050, uh, sorry, 2035, uh, we're more than halfway there. If you add up natural gas, nuclear, and uh, renewables, you know, that's anywhere from 45 to 50% yeah. right well, now. Well, now we're getting back into the need to define what clean energy is, right? No, but, but President Obama, to his credit, has broadened the definition, given us opportunity to look at the wide range of sources. And to his credit, he has suggested, I think it was a handout to the Republicans, he suggested, I, I intend to do this in a more market-based way, and I intend to do this in a way that's not going to look like a tax, which is what the prior proposals looked like. Now, I don't know if the Republicans will accept that reach. That's what's under debate right now. We're going to have to wait many months before that plays itself out. But I, I do want to say, to his credit, the president has made the reach, and so the, can we see it come the other way? We'll have to, we'll have to see. Uh, Michael, thank you. Michael Loco with the uh, World Resources Institute. Michael, I want to I get your take on this in that is the definition of what is clean energy broadening too far out? Is it, is it missing the mark because it's becoming more inclusive rather than more exclusive? Um, well, I work for an environmental think tank, um, so my... Uh, my Politics aside. Bi yeah. My bias is clear, but uh, so my definition tends to be at this point with regard to emissions. Um, I think that that's really one of the real keys. Um, I saw a survey today that said that 74% of Americans believe in climate change. Um, the survey also said that 68% of Americans believe in global warming. So uh, to me, that means that uh, either 68 or 74% of Americans currently believe that the world is changing due to the changing climate. So I think the real emphasis here, which was alluded to during the debate, but then it gets brushed aside, is really how do we define it in terms of emissions. So by those standards, I think natural gas is seen as a preferred uh, energy source. Nuclear um, generally is a preferred energy source with costs being um, often cited as, as the constraint there. So that's, that's how I define it, and that's why I think that the real need to push for renewables um, both short-term and long-term is really vital, both for economic reasons and for environmental ones. Well, and I think, Michael, that question was touched on a bit tonight in that regardless of driving the economy and turning to a clean energy uh, uh, sector to, to push that forward, is this really all about cutting emissions, looking at a global view of climate change and doing what has to be done rather than worrying about economic growth? Jim? Well, as, as I indicated, um, and now academic literature is bearing it out, um, Cleaning up the environment follows economic growth. It doesn't precede it. A wealthier society that sees more revenues flowing into its economic system goes ahead and makes the extra investments to capture the externalities. And you can look at that in peaks and valleys in the American system in particular, but it's true in Europe, it's true in Japan, it's true in other places. So, so that's, that's issue one. Um, issue two, uh, there's also an energy security externality that's hard to put a real number on. People mm -hmm. pretend right. they can, but right. you can't. Um, however, uh, it is, you can identify how much money we pay foreigners to bring energy to us versus how much of that energy we could make here and put into our vehicles here. And that can give you a good old-fashioned Ronald Reagan benefit cost test that says that money's staying in the US in our GDP ledger. Um, now, I'm a huge fan, but I don't need a new technology to do that. I need to reorient how we link up our transportation system and our power generation system. That's what I need to be able to do today, and then hopefully new technologies will make that cheaper. But I would give you an example. We have cars running around the streets of Baltimore today that we converted to plug-in hybrids, um, and those cars are refueling at the equivalent of 55 to 90 cents per gallon equivalent overnight. And in Baltimore right now, it's $3.50 per gallon for gasoline. Now, we are also working on a new plan that's going to get that pricing to 30 cents per gallon equivalent. Now, that's a, that's a huge change in the cost structure of running a vehicle around town. Um, so, but that, that's political. That's political organization of, of infrastructure, and that actually does require public policy. It requires go uh, governments getting out of the way in some places and governments getting in the place of setting codes and standards and creating all the permission that you need to install new infrastructure. Um, and by the way, I don't treat that as a government subsidy. And the government did that for oil and gas. The government did that for trains. 
Um, those are perfectly legitimate and necessary government investments of time and effort to help facilitate the standardization of infrastructure. So, um, and, and you know, that's, that was serious money back then, it's serious money now, and I don't begrudge the government that piece of it. Uh, Dan, the one international group that is showing some results regarding carbon emissions, it is still an international player, is the European Union. Cap and trade has been in effect there since 2005 or so. The benefits can be debated. But you don't hear much about clean energy developments within the EU necessarily, not in the international discussion at least. Uh, well, I'm uh, not an expert on what they're doing over there, mm -hmm. but we do have an innovation society here. And whether you're talking about the clean tech sector or the consumer electronics sector or the computer sector, many of the world's most uh, popular technologies were invented here. I think an important piece of this debate is that we need to be making some of these things here, not just inventing them and then offshoring the production, but we need to make things here as well. Because if we don't, we're going to end up with a uh, bifurcated society where you have some people in service industries serving hamburgers or waiting tables uh, or entering code, and another s part of society uh, you know, in the more uh, innovative and electronic uh, uh, economy and nobody in the middle. And having a strong manufacturing sector is an essential part of a healthy middle class. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, Governor Ritter talked about was by uh, investing in and setting a, creating a market for clean energy in Colorado, they've also helped create manufacturing jobs. Look what happened in the auto industry. Here's an example of government policy in action. In the early 1980s, we passed a domestic content law that said if you buy a car, it has to say how much of the car was uh, the parts and then the, then the construction were in the US versus other countries. And so what happened that then? Foreign auto companies, whether it's Toyota or Nissan or BMW or others, are building their plants here. Right now, we've got to do the same thing. Let's create a market for a clean, clean tech. Let's create incentives for China and other countries to build solar plants here, like they're doing in North Las Vegas. And that can help take our innovation uh, economy and marry it with a strong manufacturing sector, which is essential, like I said, for a strong middle class. Yeah, but, but where Robert Bryce nailed it, even in this subject space, though, if you, if you want to see volume of new manufacturing and volume of new jobs, especially, by the way, union jobs and building construction, it's in natural gas and in nuclear. Um, you know, no matter how you slice and dice the solar production or, or wind farm manufacturing, uh, you know, if we really pursued a shift from 20% natural gas to 40% natural gas, pursued 20% nuclear to 40% nuclear, um, you are talking about $2 trillion worth of new manufacturing and mostly union and high paying engineering jobs. Um, that's, that's, out, that's astounding and that's a lot better in my view, especially if those electrons are going into cars cleanly at night, um, you're displacing then a lot of that, uh, a lot of that foreign uh, d dependency as well. That's a winning equation. And again, I didn't have to invent a new technology to do that. This is government reorganizing the way it looks at how we make these systems work together. And that's our biggest obstacle. It's our biggest obstacle. Well, it's important to note that a University of Massachusetts study found that for every million dollars investment in clean energy renewables versus uh, oil and gas or nukes, that uh, three jobs would be created in the clean tech sector for every one job in nukes or oil and gas. So if you put the same level of investment that it takes to build a nuclear power plant, which I guess the average price tag now is about $8 billion, then if you put $8 billion investment in, in uh, renewables, you would create three times as many jobs, according to this University of Massachusetts study. Yeah, well, um, which, by the way, which had some issues, but the, the, you still have to remember the net impact. Those are, so you have to always have to account for net impact. And just are energy prices going up or down? If this investment is causing prices to go down, I can tell you it's good for jobs. You're adding jobs. If the cost of delivering that electricity and manufacturing is going up, I can assure you, you're losing jobs. But that's not necessarily downside. because, that's, wait, hang on a second. It, because <laughs> if the cost is going up, um, but the cost of the externalities is going down, then you're still at a net benefit. The problem is, it's very easy to measure the cost going up because it's in the a rate that people pay, and it's much harder to measure the cost of externalities going down because we don't collect health data uh, in the same way that we do uh, you know, be able to add up people's utility. But the it is, a, gentlemen, it, it is, a, it is a school night. Nuclear, I know everybody needs to get rate. up at some point in the morning. One more question, please, before we, before we wrap up, and then we will uh, call it an evening, but please. 
Hi, Bob Mitchell with uh, Transelect and also the Atlantic Wind Connection. Uh, stating prejudices, uh, we're developing the uh, offshore backbone uh, transmission line to support offshore wind. And one of the things that we've been uh, evaluating is uh, the long-term benefit, and I haven't heard that talked about tonight. Um, yes, renewables cost more today, but you're looking at a stable fuel source, be it wind or the sun, that is not going to go up. There's operational costs, of course. So I'm curious how you folks feel about uh, the fact that the price that you're paying for this renewable today is essentially the same price you're going to be paying at 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. And if anybody thinks that somebody is going to uh, sign a long-term contract for gas uh, for a 20-year contract, um, I, I defy you to find somebody who's willing to uh, sign a contract for 20 years for gas. They're certainly not going to do it at $4. They're certainly not going to do it at 6 or 8 because we absolutely don't know. We do know that renewable energy is going to cost the same 15, 20 years from now. So I'm curious how you folks factor that in. Uh, let's wrap that quickly. Uh, Jim, you first because Constellation is building and buying renewables right now. Yeah, so, so by the way, right now we are doing that. We are pursuing a portfolio because we have a big footprint. We serve 35,000 megawatts of load. We want to be sure we've got, we're well hedged across all the sources. So you're, you're, the instinct of your question is correct. Um, we do not have a durable policy environment on pricing the externalities, whether it's the health effects and or the insurance on climate change. We don't have that. If I had, you know, at Constellation Energy, if we had a 25-year um, performance uh, mark to hit, as suggested by um, some, of the, some of the policies we're hearing about recently, um, that would help us organize that portfolio investment and think more about the long-term prospects of wind and think about the long-term benefits of nuclear, right? We'd be able to monetize um, th these zero emission sources much more effectively over the long term. It's because we don't have nationally competitive electricity and because we don't have a durable policy that we have to make the short-term investments based on the, the rising and falling of coal and gas prices. And that is not the way we should be doing things here in America. Uh, and that's certainly something I would hope the Republicans and the Democrats can get together on. They actually talk about it the same way and yet they're, you know, and usually when you share a goal, you can work your way out to a policy to get you to the goal. In this space, it's, it's just bizarre that actually there is a shared goal, and yet we just can't find those, those, those policy mechanisms that will give us that 25-year signal. So we're stuck, in, we're stuck investing for the short term, but contemplating the long term. My company's been around for 200 years. We plan to be around another 200 years more, um, but we're not being given that investment horizon to work with. Dan, a good point. What happens beyond the transition? Well, first, I want to thank Energy Now for uh, hosting me at this event. It was great, and it was a very lively discussion between uh, Jim and me, and uh, I'd be honored to do it again. Uh, I think it's important to look at the long-term time horizon because one of the things that's so devastating to a middle American family budget is price volatility. At the beginning of the year, as you budget a certain amount of money, you're going to spend on utilities, on uh, gasoline, on groceries, and then to have the price shoot up by, you know, 15 or 20 percent in two months, like oil has done since the beginning of the year, uh, that could wreak havoc on a family budget. And that's very, very damaging. One of the things you have to remember about nuclear power is it may be emission free, but it's not externality free. There's a huge externality from the uh, nuclear waste that's created that's now being stored at plants all across the country. Now, I think that's a better option than shipping it all to Nevada, because the last thing we want to do is have mobile Chernobyls going around with trains and truck drivers that are prone to human error, that can fall asleep at the wheel, you know, other things like that, that one, you know, nuclear spill can ruin your whole century. So I think there are important externalities to nuclear power that need to be factored into the cost. Um, so again, thank you very much for having me here, and it's been a great debate, and I hope that Jim and I can continue this elsewhere. <laughs> Maybe outside the room in a minute or two. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing this for years. Thank you all for being here. As I said, you're here. For a reason, we value your opinion. So from all of us at Energy Now, thank you again for being with us. Have a great thank time. you. Jim, thanks so much. Thank you. Great. Dan? Thanks, Tyler. Oh, thanks. Thank you all. Well, this wasn't.